I was watching the 2023 science fiction film The Creator the other week, and whilst I enjoyed the film very much, there was one thing that jumped out at me. Whilst the movie was set in the year 2070, the telephones that they were using looked very familiar. These appeared in two scenes, and perhaps if I do a bit of zoom and enhance, you'll understand exactly what it was that drew my attention. Yeah, that in another life is a Sony MZR5 ST mini disc recorder. And seeing one in the movie made me think that this is the perfect time to take a look at my mint in box example that I bought a few years ago, but I've yet to try out. I've always appreciated the look of this machine. It's got a very interesting and unique appearance, which is no doubt why it was repurposed as a movie prop. The one I have here was found on eBay and appears to be barely, if at all, used. It's come from an office in the UK and must have proved surplus or unsuitable for their requirements. In fact, a few of the accessories are still sealed in their original packaging. One thing that was in the box that wasn't part of that original bundle, though, is this microphone whose sponge windscreen has disintegrated, shedding black dust all over the inside of the box, reminding you that whilst this might look like it belongs in 2070, it really is over 25 years old. In fact, in order to confirm when it first came out, I looked at the ever-useful Minidisc wiki, and at the bottom of the page for this device, I was met with some very pertinent, but also worrying information. It turns out that inside this device are two NICAD batteries that are used to retain the time for the clock, and after a quarter of a century, these will almost certainly have leaked, and if you have one of these devices, you need to open up the case and get those batteries out now. So that task has become the very first thing that I need to do before switching mine on. Like most owners of these, I had no idea that there were a couple of batteries inside it, so I crossed my fingers and hoped that mine hadn't leaked. Well, that hope didn't last long, as yes, whilst at first glance it doesn't look completely catastrophic, there has definitely been a considerable amount of leakage. All I could do was remove the batteries and try and clean everything up as much as possible. I'd only know what damage had been done when I powered the thing up. It might still work perfectly, then again it could be completely dead. If only I'd known about this hidden time bomb back when I bought it, I would have took those batteries out a lot earlier. But I can't go back and change it now, there's no use crying over spilt. Alkaline. All I can do is clean it up, put it back together, attach the power adapter, turn it on and see whether I got lucky and dodged a bullet this time. And it was looking good to start with. It turns on, it can detect that there's no disc inside and after inserting a disc, the machine reads the contents of that disc just fine. However, after plugging in my active speakers and pressing play, I'm not hearing anything. From the information on the screen, it's clearly playing the disc, it's just there's no sound coming out of those rear RCA sockets. So I then tried my headphones in the front socket, and again, there was no audio whatsoever coming through. This was not looking good. There is, however, another 3.5mm socket on the back, but that was dead as well. So with all the analogue outputs dead, the only thing left to try was the digital one, and fortunately, yes, this time the audio was coming through just fine. After I stop the action, you're going to practice using these buttons. So now I could move on to demonstrating the features of the device. The first thing I wanted to do, though, was set that internal clock, the non-essential feature that nearly ended up destroying this thing. I wanted to find out also what was on the disc that I found inside the box. It turns out the answer was nothing. Well, there was something. It was three short tracks of silence. And ironically, I can see when they made those recordings, the previous owners hadn't set the clock. So this machine was in the process of self-destructing, all because of a feature that no one had ever used. The next thing I wanted to find out, though, was whether the analogue inputs had been killed off by those leaky batteries as well. So I hooked up a cassette deck to the inputs on the back and pressed play on the tape, record on the mini disc, and as you can see from the VU meters at the bottom right of the screen, the audio wasn't getting through. So, yeah, that confirms that all the analogue inputs and outputs on this base unit are dead. One last thing to test, though, can it still at least record from the optical inputs? And thankfully, the answer to this is yes. So really, it makes it a digital-only recorder and player. 
it's still got some life in it. It's not ideal, but it does still perform a function. It's such a shame about the damage caused by those hidden batteries, though. I mean, this thing was mint. No one had even got around to unwrapping its remote control. So, of course, I did that. And at least the button cells in these things don't seem to mind sitting around unused for years. It needed replacing, but once that was done, it was working just fine. Now, it's got to be said, this is still an older type of minidisc machine. There's no NetMD, there's no MDLP, there's no keyboard input for easy titling and entering titles via the keys is a laborious process. But the big advantage of this system of a portable recorder with a dock was that you could leave most of the parts you didn't need on a portable at home, which resulted in a more compact personal stereo unit. The MZR5ST wasn't Sony's first minidisc and dock combo. A year prior to this, there was the MZR4ST, which enabled them to make the smallest possible recorder up to this point. This dock unit didn't have a tilting screen, and of course there were numerous other differences between the two, but one commonality is that the portables that came with each were unique to these sets. These portable models were not sold separately. They only came bundled with their docks. I don't think the R4 set was ever marketed outside Japan. All the ones that I've seen have their buttons labelled up in Japanese, whereas the R5 was clearly intended for an international audience as it came with English labelling. Let's have a proper look around it. It's really an interesting looking device. The portable recorder is held in the main unit with an electronic catch, one that can only be released when it's connected up to power. The idea of buying one device that covered both your home and portable requirements made a lot of sense. It's got all the inputs and outputs you'd need to connect this up with an existing hi-fi. And as for those two optical inputs on the back, well, of course, one would generally be used for attaching this up to a suitable CD player, while the adverts in Japan suggested connecting the other one to a satellite receiver. With the power now connected up, I can eject the portable and it's got a really tidy way of electronically attaching up with the main unit. All the connections are hidden away behind a panel that's designed only to slide out of the way when the things are interfaced together. Whilst the portable could operate via an internal LiPo battery, which allowed for a quoted playback time of five and a half hours, there is also the option to attach up a AA adapter, which would be capable of powering it for nine hours. And with both together, you get a total of 16 hours. The construction of the body and the buttons feels very solid. There's a lot of metal used. It's heavier, but also more substantial than many of the later minidisc models. The screen on the portable unit only needs to show basic information as the track titles are displayed on its inline remote. And this is the first year that Sony used this familiar stick design of remote. And again, it appears that the one I've got here has never been used. I noticed that the base has been designed so that the remote can remain attached to the player when it's docked, and that got me wondering if this headphone output would still work, but the answer is no. It's only active when the player isn't in its dock. When it's docked, you're supposed to be using the quarter-inch headphone output on the front of the base unit instead. One handy feature of this dock is that it has a battery charger built in. The idea is that you buy a second battery and then you'd always have a fully charged one ready to go. Of course, the one in the portable also gets charged whenever that device is docked. However, just like any other Sony LIP8 battery, this one will not be getting charged because after all these years, it's dead. Just like all of them. In fact, to make matters worse, nobody's making new batteries of this type anymore. Fortunately, there are a couple of workarounds. If you carefully slice open the LIP8, you can replace the cell inside with a 14500 rechargeable lithium battery. But if you don't fancy that, I found a nice chap on eBay here in the UK who's 3D printing this battery holder. I picked one up to try it out and it works just fine. Again, you add in a suitable 14500 lithium cell and you're good to go. The portable charges up this battery whenever it's docked in its base station and you don't need to be using it, it still charges the battery when the device is in standby. So not all the battery news in this video is bad news. Now, if you're old enough to remember recording music off the radio and you'd sit there with your finger over the pause button trying to keep the DJ from your recordings but make sure you get the whole record, well, this feature might have come in handy. The time machine option allows you to start a recording from two seconds before you press the record button by capturing the audio that's held in the buffer. 
And I must make a special mention of that large screen. That is way more comprehensive than most home machines and has a sense of fun about it too. Just look how the titles display in a variety of ways. Someone at Sony programmed this for no other reason than it looked cool. In fact, I'm going to let it cycle through the effects of the corner of the screen so you get to see them while I talk about the active speaker output socket. In the manual, it suggests connecting this up with Sony's SRS Z1000 speakers, which were introduced alongside this machine. If you look at the bottom right of the brochure, you can see a blurry picture of these in a neat little desktop setup. But there's no need to squint at that tidy picture because I just so happen to have a set of those here as well. They might look like plastic speakers, but in fact, while the front and back panels are plastic, the main body is metal and they are surprisingly heavy, solid and well constructed. The right speaker plugs into the left one and the left one plugs into a power adapter. It has two 3.5mm inputs on the back and there's controls on the front, including the volume and the power on off. However, the dock also has its own dedicated volume control for this output, both on the unit itself and on the remote control. And with everything connected up together, it really makes a beautiful setup, in my opinion. Of course, in my case, due to that damage, those speakers don't make a sound, but hey, they definitely look the part. So just imagine it's 1998, you come home from work, you've been listening to your mini disc on the train, you take your player out of your pockets, extract your earbuds, unclip your remote from your jacket, and you pop the player into the dock. And the music carries on from where you last left off, played through your home stereo speakers. And while it's doing this, the player charges up the battery, ready for the next time that you want to use it on its own. Now, while I do have plenty of other mini disc recorders capable of NetMD, MDLP, high speed CD to MD copying, easier track titling, I still wanted to take another look inside this one just to see if the analog sound issue was caused by a short and easily fixable break in a trace. But the answer was no. Those batteries have really done a job on this circuit board. I can't even see where some of the traces are supposed to be. They've been completely burned away. In fact, it's probably a bit of a miracle that this thing is working at all. A mint machine being eaten away from the inside by a couple of hidden batteries. I suppose the designers never considered that anyone would want to use one of these things 25 years later. And that was very nearly a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you look hard enough, you will actually find a brief mention of the existence of those batteries. Right in the back of the manual, it mentions in the section that you never read, the one about disposal, where it instructs you to remove those batteries when you're throwing the machine away. But it also tells you to never disassemble the station unit except for disposing of it. But counter to that advice, if you do own one of these, and by some miracle it is still working fine, well... Open it up today and get those batteries out of it. My advice, though, if you do encounter one of these for sale somewhere, I'd recommend just walking on by. It's a shame, but they were unknowingly designed to self-destruct. It's amazing, really, that any of them managed to survive until 2070. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.